Welcome to Shadows of Forbidden Gods. My name is Daz Tactic. Welcome to the channel. We're going to be doing a really deep dive into this particular game. Uh, this is an incredible game, actually. The more I play it, the more impressed I am by what the game actually does. There's just so many different ways that the game presents different scenarios for you to sort of uh, muddle your way through. <laughs> it's a really amazing game. Uh, and so this, I'm going to, I think, agonizing, literally agonizing on how to actually do this series. And I think I'm going to do it a bit of a combination between like a tutorial type series and also a Let's Play series. So I will do a Let's Play around a tutorial. And so the videos will be of varying lengths. I'm not going to try to sort of constrain them to half an hour, which is what I normally do. I'm just going to make, if there's a theme that I'm talking about, I'll make that a video. If I'm doing Let's Play, I'll make that a different part of the video. And I'll try to explain what we're doing in the descriptions or in the title so that at least you sort of know what theme that particular video will be. It really, I've, I've recorded this so, so much. Um, I must be up to around about 30 or 40 uh, takes now on just trying to, of the best way to actually show this game. It's one of these games that there's just so many different game mechanics that fold over the top of themselves with the actual way that the game is sort of structured. And you don't see them until you actually until you come across them. There's so many opportunities to play the game different ways. Uh, it's brilliant. Like the very few games actually are like that. A very few games. And so this is sort of, yeah, it's got so much in it. So, so much in it. Uh, there's still some problems with the game. I mean, it is only in the early, early access. And so there are bugs and missing features. Uh, and there's new stuff coming as well. There's, they're, they're adding new and new, more and more stuff with each version. I'm playing with version 0 0.9, which is a beta version at this stage. So this is a beta version of the early access game. The actual release early access game is 0 0.8. And so one of the gods isn't playable in the 0 0.8 one that is now playable in this one. And so there are certain things in the game that you know will be corrected. But it's just it's amazing where the game is heading. It's a, like I think this is a this is one of these games that is going to be a bit of an insta classic. I think when it, it sort of does hit launch, uh, but it's already very 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 good. As I say, I just can't stop playing it at the moment. So uh, this first video, uh, just to go through what we're going to be doing, is literally just getting a game started and uh, giving you a brief overview, a very very brief, like a real um, you know real sort of broad broad uh, vision of the actual game, and so to, just so you can get your head around how what to look for ultimately in the game so we'll just get started and if, as i say i've agonized over how to actually present this and i think this is the, the easiest way to to ease you into the game is just to sort of do deep dives when we need to do a deep dive and just do let's play around the other bits and pieces but this first bit what we'll do is literally just go through and um and just get a game started and uh, and then talk about what we're seeing in fact i might even load in one of my other games just so you can sort of see what that looks like you know when you're getting towards the middle of the game. So anyway, let's just go across. You've got five different gods. They all have different abilities. She Who Will Feast is the god that we'll be playing in our run through. This is the most, if I just go select, it then just tells me she's designed to be simple, simpler than the others, ideal for either new players or for games focusing on agents themselves, as opposed to a god's unique mechanics. This god does still have have different powers. She's, her powers really are spread on on like the spread of shadow and infiltration. That's really what she sort of focuses on. And then when she breaks out of her her prison, she becomes she becomes an awakened god, where she's a vast godworm and can be used as a military piece on the map. So that's sort of how this particular god does work. If I go to next and then just go to select. This is to her, the Laughing King is all this. This playing is this god is all around this particular book, the Laughing Tome, and the book can harm both agents and heroes. Agents are our guys, heroes are humanity's guys, and so and it can sort of cause madness. So that's sort of way, the way that this one plays. Again, a very different way of playing the game of this particular character. Uh, the next one is Venerva, and if we go click on Venerva, she essentially is like a a um, a naiad or a Dryad or whatever they're called, like the uh, you know the sort of like uh, essentially a, a god that's that's come from from a forest, and so initially humanity is tempted to embrace her, but then she betrays them, and so she actually sort of needs to get a lot of followers, and then sort of uh, you know and giving giving different sorts of gifts, and then the gifts turn into be sort of like poison apples essentially. Uh, next one that we have is Ophanim, uh, the divine beyond, and this is like a fallen angel essentially where. 
it's all about the f- getting faith and getting getting followers. Um, and so it's the, the Ophim's mechanics revolve around the faith and the opposite, the doubt. And so you've got like a, a bit of a dichotomy between the good and the evil <laughs> within one character. Again, interesting way of sort of looking at the game. And then finally, the one that's currently... In, there's another one that they're working on, I think, which will be coming... I'm not sure when, but anyway, that, I know that that's being worked on, which is going to be like an insectoid god. But this last one that we actually have in this version is Mammon, the Wealth of Man, Spirit of the Mountain. And so with this one here, if we select this one here, we've got a... Essentially, this god lives at a single location and draws humanity in. And so humanity sort of gets drawn into into worshipping this particular god. And the god then eats them. <laughs> and that's how he gets his power. And so it's one of these things where you're trying to sort of balance between having enough humanity nearby to draw them in and also trying to get as many, as much power as you possibly can and it's all based around greed and decadence of the actual uh, in the political environment of the actual map itself as i say the 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 base game is is very very complex anyway let's just go back to the first one and uh, i will load in one of the um actually i should just point out play the tutorials um, and and read them like when you actually come in there's two tutorials just so you're aware there's tutorial basics back up through here so the, for the purpose of this tutorial is to as neither powers nor an awakening so the god plays no part at all in this particular one we're only looking at agents so that has nothing to do with the actual tutorial this has to be cleaned up actually so you know it's early access so this would be on the to-do list i would imagine to make sure that it's tutorial basics and then explains exactly what you're going to be doing in this particular tutorial and you also got a second tutorial now i got confused with this i thought this was the tutorial and i thought that this was just a scenario like a like a campaign like a, a map that it that it loaded in for you i didn't realize this is also a tutorial so i would strongly suggest that at some point it probably will be changed but that should be said that should be saying tutorial dark empire and so this is like an end game uh, tutorial that sort of shows you what the goals are really in the game and that's actually quite a good one to play as well they, they're both very very valuable to play they don't take a hell of a long time to play but make sure you read what you're clicking on I skimmed through the first time I played well the first one I just I only played this one in here so I skimmed through that and didn't really understand what was going on because I thought yeah I know what to do I'm just going to quickly quickly uh, rattle through because I tend to find that tutorials get a bit too verbose. This one was fine. It's just that I just, you know, I thought, yeah, I, I get it, I get it, I get it. And anyway, I didn't get it. And I had to then come back and do it again properly. So uh, I would strongly suggest you do that. That will give you a bit of a, an, an understanding of the game. Or, you know, watch these videos, I guess. Or watch anyone's videos on the game. You'll get a bit more of a feel for it as well. So anyway, I'm going to go back and start a new game. Right, so new game. Back and through here, we're going to choose this particular goddess. And so, you know, she basically, we've gone through what her powers are, which she sort of spreads shadow. She is going to become a vast godworm when she awakens, when when her final seal is broken, which is sort of towards the late, the late game. Uh, you'll probably win the game by that stage in, in most cases, particularly if you're playing on a smallish map. Uh, anyway, let's just go and select. This is the map generation. I won't spend too much time with this, but essentially you've got like X and Y size for the for the random maps. They are all are all random unless you use one of these um, these game seeds, which is just literally zero, one, and two. <laughs> so it's still a random map, but using those particular seeds, or you can actually have your own random seed, which is which is fine. We'll just do that. Uh, X and Y can go as little as eight. Uh, so 8 by 8 or as, as much as 64 by 64 or 8 by 64, whatever you want to be doing. But just be aware that the bigger the map, the more difficult the game will be because it's going to take longer to actually take it over. So I'm, I've been trying to find a, a setting that gives me the most to look at and the most to interact with, but still actually keep the game fairly short for this sort of for this sort of series. And so I've sort of found that like between 24 and 30 seems to work pretty well for me. So uh, I'm going to change this one to 28 by 28. Um, for getting started and uh, again random world back th down through that side normal settings down through here there are other settings as well uh, if we just go to advanced options you can turn off the time limit if you're concerned you've got 500 turns I'll keep it on but if you are concerned particularly if you're playing on a large-ish map you may want to turn that off uh, you've also got like whether you want to have orcs on the map or deep ones on the map so the orcs are factions on the map that are against humanity so they actually sort of help you so if on orcs will spawn to harass and invade human nations you can make use of them and it also does open up where you can recruit a warlord for your own use 
which is a powerful orc that uh, sort of works with might and command essentially on the on the map itself they're two of the the four main ways of sort of playing the game you've got like uh, might um, law intrigue and command and the orcs are all about strength so they're all about uh, you know, hunting things down, fighting them, raids, etc., etc. Uh, the deep ones are a it's like a hidden cult. If on the deep one, cults will automatically appear in coastal regions. Now, not in all of them, only in only in one or two on the maps. We're gonna, the size we're going to be playing, but anyway, they're interesting as well. These cults are very hard for the humans to root out. They will keep on sending heroes to try to sort of finish them off but <laughs> but they're always just going to keep on reappearing so we can sort of help that as well with our agents to sort of give them some some more strength so they're fun to play with having, having them turned on now the alliance at the end of the game the the game sort of splits into into humanity that's that's fallen to the shadow who who you control and humanity that's that, that is sort of more adherent to the light um, and so in this case the alliance will rise up in, in the late game to oppose you they can be set to resist internal threats, so no shadow or infiltration, which is the one that we have in through here. Uh, disabled, which is the bottom one, or, set, or left as normal, which means essentially that you can still corrupt them. But if you leave it the way it currently is, all of the shadow that, that's actually inside the, the, the cities that are not going to be part of, of your uh, group, any, anyone that joins the Alliance will automatically have all of the shadow and all of your infiltration purged from, from within. And that's basically, yeah, that's that's... Essentially, it just means that they're an enemy, and the, the only way of defeating them is then militarily. So that's sort of where we end up at the end of the game. Um, anyway, that's still fine, because quite often you win the game before you get to that point. <laughs> and it's up to you when you get to that point to a large degree. So there's a lot you can control in the actual game itself. So we go to the next page as well. And so this one here, we've got like mid challenge events. Every 10 turns that you're doing a challenge, when your agents are doing a challenge, there'll be an event that pops up. and Usually it's a negative event, so you'll have a choice between maybe taking some damage or having the event take longer, for example. That tends to be fairly typical of these sorts of uh, these sorts of um, events. Uh, I'll leave them on. You can turn them off if you, if you wish. You've got end of turn and movement events in through here. You can shuffle the random seed after the map generation so that, so that the heroes and, and so on and so forth are different each time. Um, and also that the events, I guess, are different each time as well. After that, if you if you prefer, I'll leave it off. The defaults are off. Pangaea, if you're wanting to just play on a, on a massive landmass with no islands, I do like the islands. I like the fact that um, there's certain things that the that the oceans have connotation with in the game, and conclaves as well. The chosen one can call conclaves to access powerful abilities. The chosen one is the not the leader of humanity, but this is who humanity starts to look towards, towards the mid and late game as a character of immense strength and character who can actually then go and and uh, bring humanity together. And the chosen one is the one that tries to bring the alliance together. And so they do that through awareness, awareness of what you're trying to do. So the chosen one is against you pretty much from the start of the game. So uh, we'll start, actually I won't start, what I might do is I might load in a game um, I wonder if that would be the best way to sort of show the mechanics of the game. I think we might do that. Yeah, look, this is a game that I was playing where of um, a turn in 100. So we're just sort of heading towards the middle of the game. Uh, so of the 500 that we have, the, the game lasts 500 turns unless you do turn it on to endless mode. Uh, we can sort of see this is the status of our goddess over through here. We've got uh, power, a power factor. I've been spending the power points. So I've only got one at the moment at this, at this particular point in time. It's not a power point that you plug things into, but the actual power allocation <laughs> that you actually have. And so we're gaining a lot of power per turn at this stage of the game. And so next power gain will be in two turns. So we'll then go from one to two. The power then gives me different things to do down through here. I've got different abilities. So in two turns time, I'm going to be able to cast Eyes in Shadow or Dangers in the Dark. If I get to three, I'll be able to get Fleeting Servants. And I've already got a split shadow on the map. I can only have one of these at any one time. So I've already got one of those on the map, which I can show you. Uh, so anyway, we've got different abilities. And as we break through the seals, we get more and more power available to us, more and more spells that we can then sort of use the power for to affect the world. So we sort of do things that way initially with this particular character until she finally breaks through the ninth seal and then becomes a force on the actual map itself. Uh, the next seal breaks in eight turns, for example, at this particular point in time. 
We can also see that we've got agents. Now we've got three or four agents uh, back in through here. And so I can actually bring another agent into the, into the world and I've got two recruitment points. So what that means is I can go down to here. This is sort of like the stuff we can do with our God in the bottom here for create agent. And I've got different agents. They come in different categories really. We've got unique agents that are down through this side where if they die off, we don't get them back again. And some of them have got different parameters that can only be brought in at a particular point in time. Like at this stage of the game, I've got a plague doctor who can only be brought in if there's a location with plague, as an example. And so he can be brought in at this point in time, but at the start of the game, he usually can't. And, he, and these all have unique abilities and unique aspects about them that do different sorts of things. So we've got, for example, like the Baroness is like a, a vampire. Uh, she requires a location with a desecrated holy site. So we need to find a holy site, desecrate the holy site, and then we can bring her in if we're wanting to. And she's got incredible might. You can see there on the right-hand side, it's got might, law, intrigue, and command. She uses might and command as her main, as her main weapons, similar to usually what the chosen one will have using against us. So these are our agents. This is who we can actually bring onto the map. And uh, we also then have gener generic agents, the Hierophant, the Warlord and the Warlock. And so I can have multiple of these as well on the actual map. I can I can just play the game just with these guys if I wanted to. I don't have to go with these unique ones, but some of these unique ones you see there, the, the Might 6, even a Warlord is only got a Might of 4. And so the Warlord has to have, we have to have Orcs on the map for, for a um, for a Warlord to come in. So that's the agent. So I won't, I won't get too involved with that. Anyway, that's the, um, so Essentially, we've got agents we can bring in as long as we've got the casting points and the agent points available. The agents appear on the left-hand side here. Now, we've got four showing because we've got a shadow that was, has been brought in. The agents then go and do different things. Like if I go and click on one of these agents, we can then sort of see that he's over here and he is traveling at the moment. We've got another agent in through this side. He's currently laying low, trying to get his profile and menace down, which is, we'll talk about this when we get into the game, but this is essentially how much of a threat he has seen and how much he can be seen around his location. We want both of those kept as low as possible for those sorts of characters. And so in this case, we're using him for political subterfuge. This is the courtier, uh, one of our agents. And so his his job is to sow dissent between the different kingdoms. I'll just zoom in a little bit so we can sort of see what go, does go on. By the way, the game is sort of played with kingdoms. If I just press number one, these are the kingdoms on this particular map. We've got a massive kingdom in through here, a, uh, a, a medium-sized kingdom in here, a small kingdom in through this side and a couple of orc factions as well this is on a 24 by 24 map by the way uh, so not much going on really with them so it's a fairly digestible sort of size to play the game and so that's what's happening at that particular location if i just press zero so sorry press number one which uh, gives me that particular map or i can press this as well it gives me the same same sort of deal but if you're going to use these buttons some of these there's maps that you can access that actually aren't there yet anyway the um so this guy is just laying low. He's trying to get his menace and profile down to the minimums. He's already got his profile down so he can't be seen all that well, but his menace is still coming down. Another one of interest, if we click on this character over through here, you can see his menace is fairly high at 40 and his profile is you know, sort of low-ish at 15. So he can't be seen very far away, but he's in the middle of of the location, essentially, of, of his, this human kingdom. And he is raiding at the moment. So he's actually in the middle of a raid. He's still got 18 turns left to fulfill this raid. So that's, we've got an orc warlord, essentially, to, to go and do that one there. So that's what our agents, our agents have different things that they can then go and do. Um, if we have a look at him, he can also then switch across. He's got different abilities. So with him selected, these are what he can do at this location. He can actually attack the Lightbringer, uh, Rupert uh, Corndor. Uh, he can uh, drop any money that he's got if he wanted to. He, can, he doesn't actually have any gold at this stage. He, can, uh, he can't do any of these things just yet, but he's raiding at the moment. He can assassinate someone here. He can fuel the, f the flames of uh, like other problems in there. So your agents have got different abilities and they all ha also will have fairly unique abilities as well, some of them. Like if we go back across to this one in through here, he'll have his unique challenges that he can do up the top through here, like stealing items and causing scandals, escalating vendettas and things like that. That's what he does. And then he's just got generic challenges down through here as well, that he can infiltrate the docks at this location, fuel the fire again, assassinations, things like this. 
And these all chew up different aspects of what he actually does get to do, which is either might, law, intrigue, and command. And you can see that this character is very, very strong with intrigue. So anything to do with this, I think it's purple. I'm a bit colorblind, so I can't tell. I think that's blue and I think that's purple. I think that's purple there. I wish that the colors were a little bit more pronounced, to be honest, and uh, a bit more colorblind friendly. <laughs> and so that requires um, high in intrigue to actually make that one uh, like work. And so that's that's an example, like a command of three, fuel of fire, he's going to be using, you can see there in the, in the green on the left hand side, it says stat, command of plus three, infiltrate docks, stat, intrigue of plus six. If I get into brutal assassination, it's going to take me 85 turns to do that one, because I've only got a might of one. So that's the that's the sort of reddish black at the top of the uh, top of the list there. Anyway, that's sort of where we are with those characters. The um, so, that, so we've got our own agents trying to sort of sow dissent, trying to create shadow. And you can see down through here, we've actually got some shadow that's creeping out from this Witch's Coven. So I've sort of used this Witch's Coven to, to push enshadowment out to these locations. That's nearly falling. The rulers here are falling to, to the shadow as well. She's at 82% shadow enshadowment. So they don't even know, she's not even aware that she's actually falling to the shadow. So she's, her awareness is zero, but she's actually falling that way. Uh, and so the game is played where we use, initially we use have to use a lot of sneakiness and subterfuge. We don't have to, but we, we, you know, it's advisable, I guess, to a degree, uh, to start to sort of slowly eke your way into the civilization of society. So you've got different human settlements all running all the way through here. These are all human settlements we sort of see. In fact, if we hover over the victory locations or victory points, it tells us that a uh, number of human settlements at the start was 21. And so to win, we need to have 21 points, and we have different points for different things that we then do in the game, which I'll explain when we actually get into it. So the premise essentially is, is that you've got humanity is in these different kingdoms. They can fight against each other if they don't like each other. Uh, individual characters can also have enemies as well. Like, for example, if we pick on this, this character here happens to be the chosen one. And so he is uh, wandering around. Generally, they're pretty strong. But I killed the previous one using this orc. <laughs> so he's already done some damage quite some time ago. And this is now the new chosen one. Not as strong as the original one, but he's still he's building up. So he's at the moment, his his challenge or quest is, is to redeem the mage uh, Tassimus uh, Pindamar, who is a mage that happens to be over here. And so he's coming across to try to remove the 22% shadow that she actually has on her. So that's his, at the moment, he's just coming across to try to sort her out. So that's his particular mission. So the humans also, their heroes, which we see in these circular uh, icons, are uh, they actually move around doing their own missions as well. She's just resting at the moment. And so he will come, remove the shadow from her, and then he'll go off and find another mission. Now, the humans will all have different motivations. If we just go and if you click on one of these and just have a bit of a look, you can see that his main motivation is to redeem her. And you can see there what the motivations are that are kicking kicking in. And so um, you can see there that the motivations are 30 because it's close family. So if we go and have a look at his family as an example, and we'll look at this in more depth later on. So he is here and that's his sister. So he's going off to help his sister. So that's actually why there's a, a family connection there. Uh, the hero is in danger because it's, he's falling to the shadow. Uh, he dislikes the shadow. If we hover over there, you'll sort of see that under his dislikes in the right-hand column towards the bottom there, he dislikes shadow. Uh, he, um, what else is in there? And it's in my homeland. So he, his, this, he's got a, a special thing where he thinks, okay, yeah, this is something important to me for all of those reasons. And so he's motivated to do that one. Um, his next strongest motivation after that one is to defeat an ogre somewhere. So he's got this one in, in through this in the side. So he's got <clears throat> there's uh, 50 menace because because of the menace that this ogre does create. There's a negative 12 because of the, the potential danger. Now you sort of think, okay, well why isn't he going to want to attack this character? He doesn't want to attack this character for the simple reason we've got ogres. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a, this is an extremely strong character, and if we go back and have a look at him, he doesn't have anything. Oh, he's got these guys, which are really quite weak. They've got no, nowhere near the strength of the ogres. Like our ogres have got like ten hit points, four attack, three defense. His um, his minions have got so these are just cell swords with two hit points, two attack, and two defense. So much much weaker than mine. He does have pretty good attack and defense himself, but you know really it's it's it's, it's a, he's not going to win that fight. And so if we have a look for his motivation, it should be on here because he's aware of us. Um, there he is, way down the bottom here. And if we hover over that one, 
it's we've got the 40 percent menace ability that we actually have that because of the menace that we ha actually have inherently and so as the menace increases there's more pressure on him to go and attack us there's a base reluctance because he probably dislikes um might he might dislike conflict or something i'm not sure what the base reluctance would actually be uh but also the big one at the top there is we're too dangerous for him negative 230. so the game actually has these motivations every hero in the game will have their own motivations and some of them sometimes will actually have an enemy on the map as well, which we can sort of help to create. And then they'll go against, they'll, they'll work against the enemy. I think that there's a Duchess up in here. Now she's falling to the shadow. She's at 50% at the moment. But see how in her dislikes in bright red and in capitals, it says dislikes its warlord Arius. And she also dislikes orcs. That means that her, what she's more focused on, she's going to do everything she can um, if we click on her, I don't think we can actually go to and actually do anything with her as such. We can't see what she will do to us. But anyway, she's got an intense dislike for this warlord. <laughs> and so she'll do everything she, she can in her power to make it difficult for him. So we've got kingdoms on the map. We've got characters within the kingdoms. We've got people inside, like we've got the, uh, this is the actual capital with the the little line above it. So this is the uh, the uh, the capital. Actually, I think we've the the king who was there must have just died. I guess. Look at events. Yeah, King uh, Basnadep uh, Pin Pintamat dies of old age, and so this this particular king has actually just died in in the game. And if we have a look at this one in through here, his heir is the Baroness Pito Deer. And if we go and click on her and go to wherever she is, she's actually over through here she's just a baroness but she's going to then become the, the next queen so she's going to be this will become a queendom at the next turn and so she'll then take over and then her heir at this stage is this particular character uh who is really just a minor noble and she'll take over as the baroness so if we go into there she's actually just staying in this location not as a, not as an actual character so she'll then go across and become the um the baroness of this convent and so that's sort of how the game does work. It's, uh, so it's quite simple in its mechanics, but quite intricate in the way it works. You don't have to know all that. It just does all that automatically for you. So I'm guessing that, that he, yeah, he dies of old age, this particular king at that location. Uh, we can sort of see through there, there's also um, the stuff that can complete start plague. So we did actually start a plague in this location. So there's a plague that's sort of, sort of just been, get, been started. I wanted to decimate the humanity in this part of the map while we actually focus more on getting the shadow into this part of the map. So the game is very much about how you can sort of sneak your shadow in, take over, over surreptitiously different areas of the actual map itself. The hexes don't play much of a role at all, except to sort of show that there is shadow creeping across into these various regions. But we've still got a little way to go in this region to sort of get the shadow to creep even further over. Uh, it's really quite cool. The, and I guess the, the thing that sort of gives you a bit of direction with all of this and sort of gives you the mortar between all of these different uh, myriad of bricks that you've got in, you know, that are playing in the game is the world panic. Essentially, as this escalates, this then creates issues for you and also for you know things that are actually sort of happening in the world itself now we can see through there we've got world panic causes we've got 20 percent world shadow we've got two percent fallen shadows and the the god awakening sets a minimum of 20 percent now that bottom one is as our god awakens that's the mac that's sort of like a, a level that the that the world panic will, will increase as each seal is broken now we, we can ignore that if the sum of the other ones are higher than that bottom one. Otherwise, that's the, that's the actual panic. So the world shadow is at 20%, and there's a couple of heroes that have been killed off. So actually, no, fallen heroes are not that they've been killed off. They're fallen to the shadow. So we've already got like a little bit of, of shadow of characters that have fallen across into, into being con not controlled by us, but essentially being under our influence. So it's only really the start of the game at this stage. And you see it in the bottom there. This is the different things unlock at different levels. So when we get to 25%, the chosen one can progress their quest. At 35%, heroes can spawn with minions. 75%, heroes can try to defeat you. And at 80%, the chosen one can fulfill a prophecy. And that's when they then go into the final stage of the game. Uh, if we have a look down at the victory, this is more for us. And so we saw there before, we've got 21 human settlements on this particular map. Uh, and we get points based on what we do. 
And we can see we've only got two points at the moment, and they those two points come from that about the fourth one down. It says in shadowed rulers and heroes, where we've got it's got one point times two rulers. So we've got two rulers that have been corrupted. And so we've got two points there. But if we can destroy settlements, we get two points per settlement that's destroyed. If we can form a dark empire for every location, human location that falls into the dark empire, we get two points for that one. If we can in shadow and make a ruler insane, we get two points for each ruler that we do that with. And if we just have insane rulers and heroes, we get 1.75 points for those. So this is sort of how we get to our victory conditions. So there's numerous different paths to victory in the game. Anyway, I think that's enough of an introduction to the actual game itself, but it's as I say, it's intricate. It's easy to play because you're only really using your heroes or your, not your heroes, your agents. The heroes, you've, like the terminology, the, the heroes are doing their own things. Like she's devastating orcish industry. Like she'll hate orcs, for example. <laughs> yeah, so she's got an intense dislike of orcs and particularly the Arat Hills Horde, which is this particular horde down through here. Um, so this is Fortress Arat. <laughs> so so she just spends her time coming in and uh, with her knight and upsetting the 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 orcs and uh, so she does not doing anything at all to try to save you know the, the 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 land from the machinations that we actually have going on in here very very interesting game anyway that's a bit of a brief overview of the game it's fairly fairly broad overview in the next videos we're going to be going through the next video will be how to set up a game and what to look for and how to evaluate uh, whether it's worth playing a game or whether you should restart thanks for watching i will catch you then